Yeah. All right. I actually wanted to start back here with this quote from Trio that we started off the unit with, the part two, which is going to be uh, exposing the roots of power. The ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility. And the reason I wanted to start there is because I want to talk first about whiteness and white privilege. I'll move this around a tiny bit. There, that should work. There. And uh, I was curious about this. We actually began this, I, I, I know it was a small section of the chapter. Before we get into the individual racism and institutional racism, there are these tiny little sections in there, but I think they're important, which, uh, which were technically included in the reading and came up on the quiz, which has to do with whiteness and white privilege. And I was interested in this because in some ways, uh, well, at least in the, your, your web discussion comments, nobody actually, one person said the word whiteness, but nobody talked about whiteness or white privilege. And so I thought it was interesting that we kind of skipped right over that because that's exactly what Trio is talking about when he talks about the invisibility of power. And so, you know, whiteness is kind of, in some ways, it's, it's more embarrassing to talk about. Who wants to talk about whiteness? I certainly am not excited to talk about it. Whiteness has been what we call in anthropology an unmarked category. That is to say, it sort of slips under the radar, you might say. It's the default category, and it's, and in being a default category, it is invisible or you know it is often not visible and so that's what uh, trio is talking about and 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 uh, guest is talking about here with trying to unmask the roots of power or the structures of power we have to deal with these things that are typically not visible or are hard to analyze and it's something that you know it, it doesn't get discussed much. It's not something that usually comes up at the Thanksgiving dinner table. And so it's difficult, I guess as it defies analysis. It's not impossible to do. You just have to work at it a little bit because you know some people don't want to uh, don't want to talk about it. So we are gonna talk a little bit about whiteness today, at least before we get into the racism stuff, um, because we, it's, it's vitally important to talk about that. And so then he goes into the idea, uh, it's a term that was uh, coined uh, about 20 years ago, the idea of white privilege. And so the idea of white privilege is that when we're talking about race and we're talking about racism, that racism isn't just a series of bad things that happen to black people or people of color, that it also is a system of advantages for some people. And it's not, that's not to say that, that all people equally benefit, but white privilege turns our attention to what, uh, it was actually coined by, I think, Peggy McIntyre, uh, an article I used to assign that it's called the, in, un, the Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack of White Privilege. So Peg, Peggy McIntyre, I'm sorry. But uh, th what she was saying was, is that these benefits are not because of something I did. They're just stuff that accrues to me just because I am part of the white category. Now, whenever we talk about white privilege, we do have to acknowledge that as Guest goes on to say, this doesn't mean that all people sh who are marked or unmarked, you might say, as white are going to be in some sort of automatically privileged category. So, you know, whiteness 
always has to be considered with class. And so, you know, being white and rich or being white and working class or being white and middle class is different than, uh, is, is going to, to have different effects. And here, uh, Guest is drawing on a study which also talks about region and what it means to be white, uh, white and lower uh, working class in the South, for example. It also intersects with gender and sexuality. So this is something we'll talk about in a second, the idea of intersectionality or that whenever you're analyzing these things, you have to analyze them together. They're not just separate things that you can, uh, that you analyze on their own. You always see these things uh, together. So I'll talk about uh, this a little bit. And I just want to use a couple examples from my own life and growing up. And I grew up in, uh, grew up in rural Montana, which has anybody ever been to Montana? No, it's a long way away. It's not, sometimes if you're, if you come from sort of way upstate New York, it's not that dissimilar in some ways. Um, but you know, I, that's where I grew up. I wouldn't say, you know, we weren't, we weren't considered rich in our town. We definitely weren't, uh, we, nobody, nobody was rich really in, in rural Montana where we, grew up. And so I grew up kind of in this sort of zone of unmarked rural, not how to say, it wasn't, it wasn't a wealthy place. We were the last people on our road that had a telephone. And if you went further down the line, people didn't have phones. So, you know, it was kind of a under, underserved area of Montana. My grandfather, that's where I get my last name from, was an immigrant from Italy. And he lived uh, in Oregon and California. And so then eventually my parents made it out to Montana. So as I look back though, on my own life, you know, I think, well, you know, I was sort of this rural white kid growing up. In what sense did I benefit from what we might call white privilege? And I think back to what we were saying about, um, if you remember about what the United States did with immigrants. So what do we do with people who didn't quite fit into the traditional categories of race? So when my grandparents came here uh, as immigrants, um, you know, Italians were kind of ambiguous as to where they should be classified. And Italians were a little too Catholic a little too much garlic eating. People used to talk about them as sort of given to crime and larceny. Um, there was a lot of fear that Catholics would, uh, were, had more allegiance to uh, the, the Pope and to Rome than they did to the country. Uh, that even came up with John F. Kennedy, our first Catholic president. So, you know, there's a, a, a lot of kind of uh, anti-Catholic sentiment at the time. Uh, and, and it was ambiguous whether Italians were going to be welcomed into the social situation. At the same time, we talked about uh, Takawa Osawa, who was a Japanese uh, person who petitioned for citizenship to the United States Supreme Court. And this is, I think, in 1916 or thereabout, in the 1910s and 20s. And his petition was turned down so that people who were of Asiatic descent could not become citizens. Now, the Italians could naturalize and become citizens. So when I think back to what happened then. My grandfather actually lived next to a Japanese. They, they, had, they had two farms, two little farms in California. And the person, his neighbor, was a Japanese farmer who grew strawberries. And, you know, they became friends but my grandfather, even though both of them were immigrants and both of them barely spoke English, he was able to naturalize and become a citizen. 
So that citizenship carries down so that someone like me can then move to wherever I want and grow up wherever I want. So I put up this picture. This is a, this is a picture of the US track team winning an Olympics in 2016. And I like this picture for a number of reasons. If we just look at it for a second, we can think about race and color distribution and what happens in the United States with our racial classifications. It's a nice little illustration of clinal variation there. But what it reminds me of, or the reason I looked for it is because, you know, when I was 12 years old, watching the 1980 Olympics, and uh, a, a, the US female track team in that year too, ran, won the, the four by 100 meter, what do you call that thing? The relay. And, you know, it was people, uh, Americans waving the flag, and I looked at a picture like this, this was on television, of course, and I said to my grandfather, I don't feel like they are Americans like me. And, you know, looking back on this, it, it makes me kind of shudder a little bit about how I assumed, even though I was a second generation or third, I saw a third generation immigrant from someone who had, you know, it was ambiguous whether he would be naturalized. I could be a 12 year old and look at a picture like this and wonder if the people included in that picture were equally American. And as we know from American history, you know, a, a lot of people were brought here maybe seven, eight, ten generations ago. And for me as a, you know, I wasn't fresh off the boat Italian, but pretty close, to be able to think about myself as belonging to the nation in a way that I was unwilling to extend to others it is, you know, pretty much white privilege in action. And uh, it's, a, it's a system of unearned advantages which lets people do things without necessarily revealing their attitudes about other people. So this brings us to the discussion now of what uh, several of you sort of honed in on, I think a very important point from guest, the idea of institutional racism. So institutional racism is what we call the pattern of racial inequality. It refers to how inequality is mapped onto race through cultural institutions, churches, schools, through policies, these can be laws or they can be uh, other in more informal policies that are enacted. And through systems, we can talk about economic systems, uh, places, uh, how people get jobs, healthcare, uh, schools, as are also key cultural institutions, that maps inequality onto uh, in, into a pattern of behavior. And what I would say here is that what makes white privilege possible, what makes it possible for someone like me to think of myself as a white citizen and reap the benefits of that is exactly this system of institutional racism. So that what happens is, is that you don't have to necessarily do anything or think anything to kind of benefit from the system as it is. And so this is where 
uh, Eduardo Bonilla Silva's book, Racism Without Racists comes in because, you know, I don't ever have to do anything mean or be a racist to sort of get the benefits from the system which I'm enjoying. And some of you may have seen that thing that probably shouldn't even be called a debate because what was that? Um, but you know, there's a, you know, there's the headline that famously when asked to denounce white supremacy, the president did not denounce white supremacy. And you know, I mean, it's sort of like, it, it's kind of, it defies, it defies smartness. Like the smart thing to do is just say, hey, I'm not a racist. I mean, in the past, everybody just denied it and said, hey, I, that's terrible. That's a bad thing. And now we seem to be in a place where people don't even feel like they need to do that. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly where we are in this country, but, you know, it, <laughs> It used to be that people would just say, aha, that's bad. And then you could go on reaping the benefits of the system. Now we're in a slightly different place. Not sure, like I said, where that place is, but here we are. So this brings us to, or back to the idea of individual racism. So, you know, when we, when we sort of do do things that are mean, then, then we start getting, you know, that's when people say, hey, you're a racist. And I guess for me, I have traditionally thought that, well, one of the problems in our society is we are very uh, attuned or we're very concerned with individual racism and individual attitudes and you know whether we're trying to avoid the label of being racist or avoid any sort of uh, racist thoughts or ideas or you know or or accusing other people of individual racism and so that can be a little bit problematic if if that's all you're focused on and then the sort of institutional racism or just discussing about white privilege just gets ignored you know, if we're only focused on individual attitudes, then you're never, you're, you're not going to really address the underlying systematic aspects. However, over the years, I have come to uh, agree or come to understand that, you know, some of the things, you know, that, that the, the little things that we do, the attitudes, those subconscious things that we uh, that are called subconscious sometimes conscious little microaggressions are important and they accumulate for people who are exposed to them over time so as guest tells us this can very much result in in depression and rage and psychological uh, trauma uh, when these sort of uh, you know microaggressions accumulate he gives the example of sort of um, the locking of doors when you drive through certain neighborhoods. There was a, a sort of a, a, an editorial in the Times once by Brent Staples, and he, he talked about, you know, being, being a black man, and he'd always hear that thunk, thunk, thunk of the car doors locking when he'd walk by. And he said that, you know, he was a, a he was, he was, was well-educated, relatively upper class, and so he whistled Vivaldi to sort of say, hey, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a threat here. I know my classical music. I, so he, 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 would, he would whistle a classical tune, but he just kept hearing the funk. So eventually it just made him really angry, and so he'd jump out, you know, he'd sort of scare people. And, you know, you can see how people kind of go through this over time. It's like, you know, whatever you do, it doesn't seem to uh, have an effect. And then 
eventually it has uh, a psychological effect on the self. So, uh, so the idea of microaggressions, and then as several of you pointed out, and I think it's very important, um, for many years, uh, for various reasons, uh, US Americans believed that our ideal should be colorblindness or not seeing color at all. And I think that, that increasingly people have come to realize that, uh, that doing that ignores the history and systematicity of racism. And so trying to make yourself personally colorblind, I don't see race, I just see people, or trying to make your institutions colorblind doesn't really help address this history and this systematicity. And that doesn't mean we have to be, you know, hyper, let's say, uh, you know, we just have to be aware of what's going on and how this history has affected people as they uh, navigate their lives. So I mentioned before, and this is one of the few questions that we once had a little bit on in the chat, and I promised that we would talk more about intersectionality. And so here it is. It comes up in the guest textbook on page 147. And, you know, basically one of the main points of intersectionality and intersectional analysis is that we should always consider how race, gender, and class especially are interconnected so that there's, you know, and this is not, not necessarily an additive thing. It's not that, uh, it's not that you're, if you are, uh, how to say, black, female, working class, you're automatically going to be, you know, at the triple disadvantage point. It can work that way, but sometimes people are able to use, say, class privilege to negate race or use uh, use gender in different ways. So, you know, I, I shouldn't say negate race, to navigate race, you might say. But the point of intersectionality is to think about how these things are always going to be building on each other and going together. And we can't, to just analyze one is going to give us um, a, a small picture of, of people's lives. I'm gonna add on some things here in part because in the next chapter, we're gonna be talking about ethnicity, uh, also uh, sexuality and uh, ability or disability. Um, is, are, are there things to uh, consider in terms of intersectionality? How these things affect? I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything. I'm missing something, you'll let me know, right? So these are a few other things that you can think about as interconnected to the issue of uh, race and gender and class. So uh, Gus ends this chapter with the idea of, of resisting racism, which I think is an important point, I think for those of us who are looking around at uh, the situation, you might say, it's easy to get kind of uh, sad and, and depressed and thinking that things are never going to change or that, you know, is extending to the highest reaches of our society. Um, you know, I mean, especially in the last, how to say, six months or so, we've seen some pretty dramatic social shifts in attitudes and even things like, you know, whether a Confederate monument should be preserved or taken down, we've seen some pretty large shifts in terms of what happens there. And I want to point out a couple points about this, which a lot of people, when, when we have the Confederate monument debate, don't necessarily realize. These are sort of historical pointers. So as we know from school, Civil War ended in 1865 or thereabouts. The most famous general from the time, Robert E. Lee, uh, who has a lot of monuments put up 
uh, for him uh, was kind of famously wrote that he didn't want monuments erected. He didn't think it was a good idea. And as Gus says, interestingly, most of the monuments, about 80% of what we consider to be Confederate era monuments went up between 1898 and 1922. So, you know, they weren't, they weren't something that was immediately done. It was a, a long after, you know, this is 30 to 40 years after the Civil War had ended. And a lot of them went up in places that weren't even the South, like places in Indiana and stuff. And so, in fact, this doesn't seem to be the argument that these monuments are about history and heritage doesn't seem to hold up in terms of when they were put up. They seem to be put up basically as kind of, you know, a, how to say, a monument to the, to the, to the resurgence of, of white supremacy during this time. So, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a rip down everything kind of person, but I think it's very important when we think about what were people doing with the, what were the, what kind of history, what kind of position were they trying to take when they put these monuments up? A lot of it didn't really have that much to do with heritage, at least at the time they were put up. So this is kind of a, I think, hopefully a hopeful ending to the chapter. And, and I think that, you know, obviously this book, well, maybe not so obvious, but for me, it's obvious this, this book was published before we had the chance to see some of the, uh, some of the movements that happened over the summer of 2020 and some of the, the attitudes that began to shift. So, you know, it, it's, I think that um, what we saw is that, that it, it, sometimes it takes painfully long for people's attitudes to shift, but sometimes they seem to be able to shift relatively rapidly. So, questions about this uh, chapter. All right, I wanna try something which I once tried in another class and it failed miserably, so it might not work. Um, 